We're going to dive into week number seven, part seven of our Warrior Series. I have so enjoyed uh, the last uh, seven weeks getting into God's Word and figuring out how can I fight? How can I be a warrior in God's army um, on this world? You know, Jesus said that he wants us to be in the world, but not of the world. And what does that look like? Because we're, we're fighting for his kingdom. We're fighting for his principles. And, and, and so we've, we've covered a lot of different topics. Um, but today we're talking about relationships. If you missed any of the last, you know, six weeks, I encourage you, you can go online and, and check them out on our website or on the app. But this week we're talking about relationships and many times we feel like we're fighting against people. You ever feel that way? That, that relationships are a battle and relations today between people are tense to say the least. Like it feels like it's gone up a whole nother notch that, that, that from when we were kids or however old you are till now, it just feels like there's way more tension in the air. And so many times it feels like the majority of our battles in life are against individual people. Now, I know that some of you, you know, you've watched uh, the Down, Downton Abbey series. Any, any fans in the house that you're not afraid to, to say it? Um, just a couple, <laughs> right? There's, there's a relational conflict there. Some of you grew up like me on Family Matters and Full House and Fresh Prince and Saved by the Bell. And there was a ton of relational conflict there. Can I get an amen? Some of you grew up with the Brady Bunch. And if I say your show, just go ahead and shout out, shout out. Some of you grew up with the beaver, with the beef, right? Some of you grew up with Hannah Montana. Any millennials out there? Some of you grew up uh, with Andy Griffith. Come on now, right? My kids still love Andy Griffith. They'll like sit there completely captivated uh, by those guys. Um, it's, it's hilarious. But at some point, and forgive me if you don't get this reference, but at some point, Life and relationships went all Jerry Springer on us. Can I get an amen? Kids, if you don't know what that is, don't Google it. Seriously, just, just be like, I don't get that. And it's okay for me not to get that. But those of you that grew up in my area, you know that it's just gone crazy, right? Or, or maybe it was always lurking underneath. And now it's just way more out in the open. Either way, it has definitely added another dimension to how we do relationships, all this tension and conflict. There's so much division. There's so much pain. There's so much distrust. There's so much fighting. There's no filter, right? It's, it's like it's, it's, when you get behind that keyboard, whether it be your computer or your phone, it's almost like, you know, what I've heard people call like beer muscles. It's like you all of a sudden just lose your mind and you have no filter over what come, comes out of your fingertips. We're experiencing it in our families. Just this week, I've talked to people that say like, like family members, they don't talk anymore. We've seen it in our workplaces divided. We've seen it. And, and just in case you forgot, COVID has just added to our already dysfunctional ways of interacting. It's like it's just shined a spotlight on it. It's nothing new. In fact, in 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen, 18, Paul said to the Corinthian church, he said, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. And you know, as well as I, like the divisions and the, the breakdown and dysfunction in relationships, they're not just out there. They're close. They've, it's creeped into the church. It's, it's creeped into our families. It's creeped into some of your closest relationships. It's a battlefield. And so we can't talk about being a warrior without talking about relationships. And so with that in mind, let's read our text for this series. We've read it every week. Let's read it again. Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in, this, in, in the heavenly places. And so, right off the bat today, as Christ followers, we are not called to do relationships like the world. And if you're not a Christ follower, if you're kicking the tires today, if you're just checking out what this church and Christianity is all about, I would just encourage you that the way God intended relationships 
might not be like you've seen relationships done by Christians, some Christians. Man, my prayer is that you've seen some good examples of what it looks like, but, but I know as well as, as you that I'm flawed, that I haven't always done it right. I'm sure you haven't always done it right. And so you've probably seen some good examples in the church or in Christianity, and you've probably seen some bad examples. And this morning, we're not talking about that. We're just gonna focus on Christ. How does he want us to navigate and be a warrior in our relationships? Because you know as well as I, we can come up with bad, bad examples all day long. And so let's focus on God's word this morning. And so we're not called to do relationships like the world. Actually, it's the polar opposite. And so I'm gonna give you a homework assignment this week. Sometime I do this. And so get your pens, get your notes, uh, get ready. The notes are also available on our, on our Mosaic Church app if you wanna download that. But your homework this week is to read Matthew chapter five and Romans chapter 12 in their entirety and journal on it. You know, write, write some thoughts down, write some ways that you feel like, you know, you can be a better warrior for Christ in your relationships and represent him better. And so what we're gonna see from these two passages, Matthew chapter five and Romans 12 today, number one, it's the first point in your notes, is that people are not the enemy. Let that sink in. People are not the enemy. Now, if you've read God's word a lot, I, I wanna encourage you not to start arguing with me in your head because I know that there are plenty of references to enemies in the Bible. Just read the Psalms. He talks about his enemies all day long. Jesus even acknowledged <clears throat> that we have enemies. And in the physical realm, you might have some enemies. What's the definition of enemy? It's one that is antagonistic to another, adversarial to another. And if we go by that definition, then sometimes your brother and your sister when you were growing up was your enemy, right? They were antagonizing you. They're picking at you. They're poking at you. They're making your life miserable. And so from the very basic definition of what it means to be an enemy, we've all been an enemy and we've had enemies. But we're going to look deeper than that. Because by the physical definition, we have a lot of enemies. But here's the catch. As Christ followers, we follow Christ into a new way of thinking about everything, including relationships. And remember our, our, our reference verse for this series? We're not fighting against flesh and blood. You're not fighting against people. And so when you do your relationships, the very fundamental thoughts of how you think has to transform to look more like Jesus. In Romans 12, 2, it says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform. Everybody say transform. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Now that verse is very popular, including the verse before it. But one of the reasons I want you to read the whole chapter of Romans 12 is because after this, it goes into all kinds of relational stuff. And so if you're going to think about the context of why this verse was written, and you look at the verses that come after, you're like, oh, I need to change my thoughts about how I do relationships. So Jesus acknowledged that we have enemies, but here's the twist and here's how he wants to transform your thinking today. Jesus encouraged us not to treat them that way. And so when I say people are not the enemy, this is what we're talking about. Too many times we mistake people for the enemy. Listen, if you want to have a functioning relationship with your spouse, they cannot be your enemy. Do they antagonize you sometimes? Oh, amen. <laughs> you know, they, they don't put the toothpaste on right. They put the toilet paper roll on backwards and it drives you nuts. They don't fill the dishwasher the right way. They don't sort clothes the right way. They put whites and colors together in the washer. Who does that? Should I go on? Enough said. Your boss is not the enemy. And you're like, Joe, you don't know my boss. You know what? Doesn't matter. It's not your enemy. The school board, hot topic. It's not your enemy. The slow driver in the passing lane is not 
your enemy. I, I think I heard that they're, they're passing a law about that. So just all you slow drivers, you, slow drivers, you just got to know you got to get over now or else you're in trouble. That's just community service announcement. The guy that takes too long to order in the drive-thru, you ever sit in the drive-thru and you're like, what are they doing up there? Like, seriously. And you're honking, you're sticking your head out the window, you're trying, you ever try to get eye contact with, eye contact with them through the side mirror? You're like, giving them the evil eye, you're hoping they catch your glare, they're not the enemy. The person that thinks differently than you is not the enemy. The person that looks differently than you is not the enemy. Matthew 5, 43 through 38, or that doesn't even make sense. That's a typo. It says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. If you're loving someone, they cannot be your enemy anymore. In your mind, you're going under a transformation and you're going to see them differently. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good. That's a big thing to swallow and chew on. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, which let's be honest, is pretty easy. How are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Let's just boil down some irreducibles there. One that I see is that we're supposed to be different. There should be a marked difference in your life because you call yourself a Christ follower. And so if you're treating everybody like enemies, just like the rest of the world, something's wrong in your relationship with Jesus. And that's why we're looking at God's word this morning so that we can bring these areas of our life into alignment. And so if these people in our life that irk us so much, the, the extra grace required people that just, we wanna blow a gasket every time we're around them, right? What, if they're not our enemy, then what in the world are they, right? They're God's creation. They're somebody that Jesus thought was worth dying for. There's somebody that he's providing for. What does the text say? That he gives rain to the just and the unjust alike. And so even in their unjustness and their, their, their flaws, guess what? He's providing for them. There's someone that Jesus doesn't want to perish. He wants them to come to repentance. And so the big question for us is, in my relationships, <clears throat> am I getting this whole enemy mindset out? And am I bringing in the mind of Christ? And am I letting him transform my view of people to the point where I can treat them as though I love them? Amen? Number two, if people are not the enemy, then what's the enemy? Sin is the enemy all day long and every day. Now sin goes by another name and it's the devil. Right? He's the one that first influenced Eve to sin. He's the embodiment of all things that are evil. He's the representative of rebellion against God. And so sin in our life is something that can't be in God's presence. Now, this is a huge dichotomy for us because a lot of times we want to carry all our junk and carry our sin and just act like it's no big deal because God's grace is that big. But unfortunately, God's view on sin isn't that lackadaisical. It's not that simplistic. You know, there's a little bit more to it, and we should take it a little bit more serious than I think we sometimes do. And so let's look in our text today, Romans 12, 9. It says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. We love that, don't we? Let's just stop right there. And Oh, that's my, that's my verse for the day. I'm going to tweet that. I'm going to uh, TikTok that with a little dance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything because, man, I love that part. But the writer of Romans goes on and he says, hate what is wrong. Holdly, hold tightly to what is good. And so here in the text, we're given a model for relationships that a lot of times, honestly, we can't handle. 
we mess this up so bad, so much that we really struggle with really loving people, not just pretending to love them, and at the same time, hating what is wrong. Because a lot of times, we get them mixed up, and we hate the person, simply because they're caught in sin, just like we used to be before we met Jesus, and a lot of times, just like we're still struggling now. How in the world do we practically do this? How do we do it? Spoiler alert, there is good and there is bad in every person. And we're gonna look at some scriptures that back that up here in a minute. Yes, even your little perfect angel children that never do anything wrong. Have you ever met a parent like that, that their kid can do no wrong, right? Yes, even those kids that are perfect, there's sin in their heart. Yes, even your grandma, even Mother Teresa, Yes, even me, your pastor. You know, one thing as a pastor that I think is kind of funny when they put reverend in front of my name. I'm like, seriously? It's like, if you only knew me. So even your pastor, the title that I have, that I carry in life, doesn't serve as a filter for all the sin that I was born with. The world has tried to try to sell a lie that if you don't believe exactly the same as whoever is saying something, then you must not be a loving person. But here in scripture, we see differently. Why? Because it says really love people and hate what is wrong at the same time. And so even though we don't do this very well, sometimes it's worth figuring out, don't you think? Because the scripture says it that, hey, I've got to really, really, really love people. I can't treat them like my enemy. I've got to really love people that are hard to love. And at the same time, I can hate what is wrong. That does not mean I hate those people. It doesn't. You know, we've been, bought, we've been sold a lie that if you don't approve and advocate of everything that everyone does, then you're judgmental. It's ridiculous. But here in scripture, we're commanded to really love and hate what is wrong. So people aren't the enemy, sin is. That's why you can look at your child who you love unconditionally, and you could say, stop doing that, it's wrong. You love your kid, and just because you tell your kid, stop doing that, it's wrong, and if you do it again, you're gonna get in trouble. Just because you say that to your child, it's not unloving. It's the most loving thing that you could ever do for them. And so sin is the enemy, and it starts with me. It really starts with me. It starts with my personal sin, which is choices that hurt God's heart, the choices that I make that hurt my family, the choices that I make that hurt my purity and and others. You know, it starts with me. It starts with the offenses. These are things that we do to others that are wrong and things that have been done to us, you know, sin that's been committed to us that was wrong. It starts with the gossip, you know, putting a lid on that. What's gossip? It's idle talk about a person or the private affairs of others. It's when you're not a a part of the problem or the solution, but you're talking about it like you are. And we just stop doing that, it hurts. That's the enemy, to stop talking like that, to stop engaging in those conversations. Slander, it's when you're just slamming somebody and they're not even in the room. Stop talking like that. It's the bitterness that we carry. What's another word for bitterness? It's called living offended. Not forgiving as your father forgave you. And when the Bible says that when you let bitterness run wild in your heart, then it grows a root. It grows a root of bitterness inside of you. And what's a root? To me, that that means something that is a permanent fixture in my life. It's something that that gets deep down and it kind of branches out into everything that I am and it affects everything. And so people aren't the enemy. Many times it's the sin in my own life that is the enemy. Vengeance. Man, when you study Romans 12 this week, you're going to see that vengeance doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. And so when you try to enact vengeance or you try to act in a retaliatory way towards other people when they've offended you, guess who's in the wrong? You. Me. That's a hard word, isn't it? Selfishness. Man, if there's one thing that that I think could fix every marriage on the planet, Don't be selfish, right? 
Take care of the sin in your life and live pure in your relationship and quit worrying about the other person. Try to outdo them in selflessness. James 4.4 4 says, you adulterers, what a strong word. <clears throat> Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And so, so I have to talk about what is going on in my life. The sin in my own heart is the enemy, and I've got to get that right if I'm going to do relationships right. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16, um, this is Paul talking to Timothy. And Paul is like the man. He wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. He, he suffered for Christ, literally in his body. He was whipped, he was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked, all kinds of things. He was beaten. And this is what Paul says. He said, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them. I'm the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus would use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. I love how Paul's internalizing this. Did Paul rebuke and kind of tell people when they were going wrong? Yes, but he also had this attitude that he was the worst. And when you know the severity of your own sin and, and you're okay with that, that because it only elevates the, the, the grace of Jesus Christ, then that gives you a lot more influence when you do have to speak into somebody else's life in love. When you don't come as a pious you know, Pharisee thinking you have it all together, but you just say, hey, I'm just as broken and Jesus saved me too. And I'm pleading with you on the behalf of Christ to consider your choices. Christ actually left the spiritual world and he came, or the spiritual dimension, and he came into the physical world and able to save the human race. He came to remove our sin. He didn't come <clears throat> to destroy you. He came to save you from what? Not from other people. He came, you to, save you from your, he came to save you from your sin. If Jesus came to save us from people, then he would have removed the Roman Empire. He would have removed all the people that were trying to oppress the Jews at that time. He would have gotten rid of all their enemies, which were the Samaritans at that time. But he didn't do that, did he? He came to seek and save the lost. He came to save us from our sin. Sin is the enemy. And God looks at the sin in our life as so serious that, he, that Jesus said things like this in Matthew 5, 21. He said, you've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, and once again, he's transforming our thoughts. If you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and this could be like you're standing here on a Sunday morning getting ready to worship Jesus with the worship band. And you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar and go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Who's the enemy? The sin. Getting it right. Getting everything cleared up between us and other people. You can't control if they forgive you, but you can forgive them. You can do what it takes to keep your heart pure and get the sin out of your life. Right. Romans 12, 17, don't repay evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. What does that tell me? It tells me that I can't fight sin with sin. Right. I can't fight sin with sin. Any attitude that, keeps, that, that you keep that is contrary to God's word is sin. And so if you fight back with good intentions, but you use the world's methods, it's sin. That's, this is, I know this is kind of heavy, but I think it's really important for us to get today that in our relationships, we can't use the world's methods. Romans 12, 19 says, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave all that to the righteous anger of God. And so let's boil it all down. Sin is the enemy, and Christ is the only one who can and has conquered it. It's not my job. Everybody say, not my job. Not my job. It's not your job to take care of other people's sin. It's your job to love them. Right. It's your job to love them and to, to 
pray for them and to treat them as somebody that you hold dear because they're not the enemy. The sin in both your life and their life is what breaks the relationship. Number three, as we close today, my life is my love letter. So if people aren't the enemy and sin is the enemy, what do I do? You got to live your life as if it is a love letter. Why? Jesus said, hey, love your enemies. Love them. Pray for them. And so I'm, I'm going to live my life like it's the biggest love letter that I've ever received. Now, I just so happen to bring with me this morning, way back in 2002, 2003, I met Jolie. Uh, my wife, and she's the kids pastor here, and she's back with the kids today. She lights up a room if you've met her. One of the kindest people you ever meet. And so I met her when I was on my way to Bulgaria, and she was on her way to India as missionaries. And so we met and hit it off right away, and man, we loved each other. And you know in the beginning of a relationship, man, it's that love. You don't just say, I love you. It's like, I love you. You know, it's, it's, it, everything has a little bit more uh, sauce to it. Let's just, let's just use that word. There's a little bit more, you know, uh, dripping uh, co coming from everything. And so we loved each other. And so, but we were only together a few months before I went to Bulgaria and she went to India. And you're like, how's that? going to work for a relationship. And, and so we had these, back in the day, um, we had these calling cards you had to buy, and you'd have to punch in the numbers, and you only had so many minutes, and the time would run out, and, and just think I'm in Bulgaria, and she's in India, and so we'd get cut off half the time because the, the connections weren't good. And we, we would, you know, these were in the early days of the internet, and so we had Skype, and we had AIM. Anybody know what AIM is? AOL Instant Messenger? Before it was cool. We had those webcams, the like little ball that you would sit uh, or clip to the top of your computer or sit on the desk and, and it was all grainy and we would talk to each other through these. And so we got engaged. She came to Bulgaria. It was an amazing time. We got engaged in a, in a literally a Roman amphitheater that was left over from Roman times in Plovdiv, Bulgaria. Um, awesome. She goes back to, uh, to Bombay, India, Mumbai, and, and I'm back here and we're talking all the time. And one day, one day, I get this monstrosity in the mail. Now, my roommate just happened to be the security guard at this Bible school that I was working at. And so he comes walking in with this huge grin on his face and this big package. And I'm like, what in the world is that? And he's like, you got something from India, <laughs> right? And so there was this massive card with this huge letter from Jolie. And I'm like, what in the world? I'm embarrassed like crazy that everybody sees that I'm getting this crazy and like the envelope was pink and she had written stuff all over it and like what are you trying to do to me right and so but you know 100 reasons why I love you and I'm not going to read because this is private but I mean she's putting pictures on the back you know she she's like editing all the different points of why she loves me there's me with no beard and we look like we're 14 but we, we were in our mid 20s um, and so uh, so and I was like even though it was super cheesy, it's like, oh my gosh, this girl loves me, right? And as a man, you're, you're kind of like, I'm the man. <laughs> you're like, look how much this girl loves me, right? And, and if you want to come up here and read this afterwards, uh, no. Um, <laughs> you know that, but I just want to show you, it's like this huge card. And, and it's like there's this physical display of this is how much I love you. And so for you and me, when we think about how to do relationships and we think, okay, people aren't the enemy, sin's not the enemy, what in the world am I going to do? Okay, let's just visualize I'm going to write the biggest love letter that I've ever seen. But I'm not just going to write it to my closest BFF. I'm not going to write it to my crush. I'm not just going to write it to my spouse. You know, I don't know all the terminology these days, but I'm not going to just write to my bae or my boo or whatever you want to call them. You know, I heard a new word this last week. I guess the kids are saying, oh, that's drip, or, and I don't even know how to use it. But uh, I guess it means you're looking good, you're dressing well. I, 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 I'm not even sure if I'm using it correctly. Um, thank you. All right, and so, but whatever the words are, 
you know, you're not just writing it to them. You're not just lavishing the 101 and doing all this work and editing and taking pictures and, and doing all that just for those people. You're saying, God, I'm going to write a letter with, to everyone that I meet with my actions, with the smile on my face, with my words, with my actions, with my forgiveness. I'm going to write that letter with my patience. Man, that hurts me. <laughs> I'm not a very patient person. With my grace for others. And, here, and here's the ticket. And I've got the Holy Spirit as my editor-in-chief. That when I write something with my actions that isn't right, man, I'm, I'm going to retract that. I'm going to redact that. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to make it right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak new life. I'm going to write a new letter. I'm going to get up my, my spiritual eraser and take that out and say something new. I'm going to make it right. Because the Holy Spirit is renewing my thoughts. Because the Holy Spirit is softening my heart towards other people. Because he's giving me a new lens with which to see people. He's, he's helping me be wise in my interactions with, with both believers and with outsiders of the faith. Um, he's giving me influence that I didn't have because I'm, I'm writing this love letter to the world. I'm adding value to people. I'm cherishing people like the souls that they are that Jesus died for. I'm fighting this fight in a way that's way less about me, about their behavior, and it's way more about my principles that Jesus has, has planted in my life. Romans 12, 10, love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. I'm writing my love letter to every person that I meet. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. I'm writing the love letter even to my enemies. Proverbs 16, 7, when people's lives please the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. That's what God wants for you in your relationships, that you're writing such a great love letter. You're doing it God's way. You're doing it in the way that Jesus treated you, and you're doing that for others. And because you're doing that, even your enemies are at peace with you. That's way different than Jerry Springer. Way different. The weapons that we fight with in the realm of relationships are grace and forgiveness and love and patience and kindness, gentleness. We're writing our love letter. And so if we're going to be a warrior when it comes to our relationships, we got to say, this is who I will be. This is the letter I will write. This is how I will fight. I'm not going to get sucked into the ways that the world fights. I'm going to fight for my integrity. I'm going to love my enemies. I'm going to write the best love letter this world has ever seen. And you got to remember, some of you are holding. If you got your Bible lifted up today, you're holding God's love letter to you. You're holding it in your hand. You're holding it. And what does it say? It says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. I'm the worst of them all, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me. He could use you as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. And so just like he wrote his love letter for you, he's calling you to write your love letter for the world and to love them in the exact same way that he loved you. He keeps loving you even when you're down and out. Why? Because you're not his enemy. Your sin is. He keeps loving you when you're down and you're out and you're broken. And so the encouragement that I want to give to you today is to come and accept that love letter. Take it out of the mailbox. Open it up. Let it get deep in your heart and accept Christ's gift of love today. If you could bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're with us today, and you've never accepted the free gift that Jesus gave, has given us, but he died on the cross for you. He paid the price for your sin. He rose again from the grave and he did all of that so that he could have a relationship with you because he loves you so much. For God so loved the world that God gave his one and only son so that anyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. 
So if you've never accepted that gift today and you'd like to, I just wanna encourage you to boldly raise your hand as a sign today that says, God, this is for me. I need to accept your free gift of love today so that I can begin to live life in the way that you intended. If you're online today, I just wanna encourage you right in your living room, if that's you, raise your hand and say, hey, that's God, that's me. Doesn't matter where you're at. You don't have to be in church to accept Jesus. You can accept him right now, right where you're at. Amen. If you raised your hand and you wanna accept Christ today, I just encourage you to pray a simple prayer. And you can pray it in your own words, but it can, it can sound something like this. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I confess I've been a sinner. Jesus, I wanna live the rest of my life for you. You died for me, you rose again, and I wanna dedicate the rest of my life to you just like you gave your life for me. Help me to understand your word. Help me to live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us online at Mosaic Church. We hope today's message was life-changing and useful. For more info, visit mosaiccincinnati.com. 